So the first and only time I have ever been to the Walker Art Museum was over 15 years ago. I didn't know much about it then, except that it was an hour drive from my hometown and that there was no place cooler to go on a first date with my soulmate, Brian. <laughs> Brian. Six foot three, a gorgeous face, warm brown eyes and thick black hair that is always spilling out just a little bit across his forehead. To this day, I still can't hear Brian's name in my head without my mother's voice in my ear. Katie, his name is Mr. Jacobson, and this is not a date. <laughs> That's usually where I would tune her out. Sure, I was 13, and Brian was my seventh grade teacher. <laughs> and yes, he thought that this Saturday trip to the Walker was nothing but a replacement for a field trip that I had been out sick for. But the facts to me were simple. First, he was unequivocally perfect. Second, we were going on a day trip to an art museum in the Twin Cities, which if you're not from rural Minnesota is really exciting. <laughs> and third, it did not have to start out as a date for it to end as one. <laughs> the Saturday morning of our trip to the Walker, I am sitting at my house, fully made up and dressed in a carefully selected outfit, a full two hours before Brian picks me up. I am also already a complete wreck. People always describe nerves as like butterflies in your stomach, but this morning, those butterflies are really more like pelicans, <laughs> or penguins if penguins could fly. And the penguins are airborne as soon as I see a Jeep Cherokee pull into my driveway and I watch Brian step out of it. I've never seen him in non-teacher clothes before. Today it's close-fitting jeans and a sky blue polo. I am so busy watching him walk toward me that at first I don't notice that my mother has followed me all the way out to the driveway. You didn't eat breakfast! On one side of me, my mother is busy cock-blocking me. <laughs> she pulls a, sorry mom, she pulls a banana out of thin air like some kind of mood-killing magician. And on the other side, Brian's right next to me. But before I can say hello, he's reassuring my mother that we'll eat lunch at the museum. They have a great restaurant, seasonal menu, it changes every few months. God, this is my worst nightmare. But I get it together and snap out of my trance long enough to swear I'll eat later, kiss my mom goodbye, and sprint to Brian's Jeep. Today is finally here, and nothing can ruin it. Nothing, it turns out, except for the intense awkwardness of hanging out with the object of my affection completely alone. <laughs> I never knew that excitement and panic felt so similar at high doses. <laughs> my fingers tap an anxious rhythm against the door handle. The beat picks up whenever I catch myself staring at his remarkably square jaw. No, don't think about his jaw. Instead, think about the word cosmopolitan and where I can slip this word into conversation with Brian to show how sophisticated I am. I'll save it for the perfect moment, for my inevitable, never-before-heard observation about a priceless work of art. By then, the word cosmopolitan will just be the last piece of the puzzle, and the difference in our ages will just be an afterthought, to be discarded along with our tiny espresso cups. <laughs> that will be the moment that Brian realizes that I am cultured, not really an American 13-year-old after all, much more akin to a French 13. And a French 13-year-old is definitely old enough for a 25-year-old man to make out with in a secluded corner of the sculpture garden. <laughs> oh shit, Brian is looking at me. It's the crazy tapping, isn't it? He can hear it over the music. I shove my hand into a pocket. How could my own anatomy betray me? I'm pretty sure that I have no choice but to stick this traitor hand in a single glove forever like Michael Jackson. When people ask me about it, I'll tell them that this, this is the hand that lost me the love of my life. <laughs> but wait, he's, he's smiling at me. He points to my hidden hand. Keep rocking out, you like the clash? <laughs> he sounds excited, so I lie. <laughs> love them, you do too, huh? And just like that, we are sharing a moment. <laughs> Windows down, volume up sinking along together at the top of our lungs. And in that moment, I realized two important things. First, I did not and never will know the lyrics to the song that we sang that day. 
If I were back in Brian's Jeep Cherokee right now, I'd still be mumbling into the wind. Charlene don't like it. Rock lobster? Rock lobster? And the second thing, I very definitively hate the clash. <laughs> uh, unpopular opinion, I realize this now after telling this story. But I fake my way through a whole album, and before I know it, we are at the museum, which is huge and sleek and, quite frankly, cooler than anywhere I've ever been. Brian and I stroll past amazing pieces of art, but we only look at them long enough to take a breath as we talk and talk. We talk so much that I almost forget the ace of my sleeve until we pass a pastoral landscape, and I blurt, how very cosmopolitan. <laughs> I am so fucking sophisticated. <laughs> it feels like we talk about everything. And it turns out we actually have a lot in common. He plays the guitar. I own a ukulele. <laughs> and I can play any song that consists solely of an out-of-tune G chord. He is an only child. I have 10 siblings, but I often wish I was an only child. <laughs> we share a fascination with World War II history because that's what we're studying this quarter in his history class. <laughs> Everything is just going perfectly. When our path takes us past the museum restaurant and the smell of teriyaki cooking oil invades my nostrils. I taste bile in my throat and my stomach clenches up so tight that the penguins don't have room to breathe. Now Brian hits me with a one-two combination, the jab of that absurdly white smile. The haymaker comes with his question. I feel like a little lunch. What do you think? Blood rushes to my face, and the phrase seasonal menu echoes inside my head. I have learned through experience that, for me, a restaurant with a seasonal menu is a no-win situation. A restaurant with a menu that rotates every few months can't pa cannot possibly evaluate and post the nutrition facts for all their items. Which means that if we do eat here, I have no idea if the tart I shove into my mouth is 150 calories or 1,000. But I've been doing this a long time. My excuses are always ready to go. I've uh, had a stomach thing, I lie. I had a huge dinner last night. I'm just really not hungry. It all comes out way too fast. It sounds completely fake. But Brian just nods. Gotcha. We'll all survive. Let's keep walking. Relief washes over me. And we walk away from the smell of the oil out into the sculpture garden, where I can smell his aftershave again. We make it to a bench across from the Spoon and Cherry, a sculpture I've only seen in pictures until now. And we do so without a single mention of lunch. And now he's sitting right next to me. He's staring at me with those huge brown eyes. And he says, I hope you know, Katie, that you're a very special person. And then he pauses. And it's all I can do not to jump into his big, strong arms. And then he leans forward and he opens his mouth and says, Ashley! Ashley? I mean, I guess I could be an Ashley if Ashley gets a kiss with tongue. <laughs> but Brian isn't leaning in. He's standing up, and he's smiling at a tall blonde woman walking toward us. She's wearing a pink baby doll dress and high heels. Now she's falling into his arms. She must have tripped. Oh, no, now she's tripping right into his perfect mouth. What a clumsy bitch. They're holding hands now. My heart is sinking. This is not the way this was supposed to end. Her name is Ashley. She's aggressively chatty, but she doesn't listen much. Brian and Ashley tell me all about the European art tour they are planning for their honeymoon. I smile and nod and slowly die inside. And then Mr. Jacobson clears his throat. You know, Katie, we all miss you at school. And I brought Ashley here today to talk to you. She has struggled with an eating disorder. And I was thinking, you know, you two could talk about that. Oh, shit. <laughs> now Ashley pipes up. Katie, I'd love to talk to you. And I also think we should get some lunch. Brian said that your mom was worried about you eating today. Oh, hell no. It wasn't enough that she was stealing my man. Now she's going to force me to eat? I repeat my earlier lie. Stomach thing, not hungry. Thanks, though. She is not buying it. She pushes me again. 
You know your parents would be so happy if you ate something. They are worried sick. I can't stop my voice from shaking now. It's just, they, they don't have nutritional information and I'm on a strict diet. Ashley the idiot looks confused. I think your doctors would be happy if you ate anything at all. Now let's go get you some food. Eating disorder my ass. If she knew what this felt like, then she would know she is being malicious. If she knew what this was like, then she would know that of course I can't just go wolf down a muffle at a sandwich and some flourless chocolate cake. She would understand why I spent two hours last night warming up my family's ancient Mac computer, sitting through the beeps and buzzes as our dial-up modem connected, and searching for any online information about the walker in the hopes of finding nutritional information for their restaurant. Anything that would allow me to have a halfway normal afternoon that includes a meal but doesn't surpass my 300 calorie a day mandate. And she would know that most restaurants are unlikely to fit into my meal plan. My meals consist of huge dill pickles, microwaved baby carrots covered in salt, carefully measured half cups of low calorie broth based soup. Why isn't it socially acceptable to just eat pickles as an entree anyway? I don't. I have visions of punching Ashley straight in her cute button nose. It shatters beyond repair. Blood ruins that ridiculous pink dress. In reality, though, all I actually do is whisper, bathroom, and run into the building to cry into paper towels. When I come back out, Mr. Jacobson and Ashley's backs are to me. He's talking on the phone. No, she's eaten nothing. No, it's okay. I mean, I'm stressed, but just how you feel every day, I'm sure. Of course I don't mind. Hearing this uh, knocks the penguins out cold. Not only is Mr. Jacobson not the love of my life, not only is he engaged to the worst person in the world, <laughs> but the only reason we went to the walker today is because my mother asked him and because I'm sick and he pities me. I give up on the day and ask him to take me back home. The trip leaves me feeling more empty and exhausted than I've ever been. I'll still do 700 sit-ups when I get home, but it won't help. My dreams about what that day could have been might have been a little unrealistic. I was supposed to leave the walker an artificianato. I was going to leave the sculpture garden with a first kiss. And I hoped to arrive home with a new 25-year-old boyfriend. <laughs> but at the very least, I should have remembered any of the art I saw that day. And I should be able to look back fondly at a stupid but completely normal middle school crush. Instead, the thing that I remember most strongly of my day with Mr. Jacobson at the Walker is the smell of teriyaki cooking oil and the feeling of penguins strangling in my stomach. A lot has changed since then. While everything used to be about my disease, I'm happy to say it's been over a dozen years since anything had to be about it at all. And now I eat all the time and don't think much at all about how many calories are in my food. A few things have not changed though. Mr. Jacobson is still gorgeous and I still can't stand the clash. <laughs>